It was about ten months since we had last seen him, but that time had sufficed to make an alteration of years in his appearance. He had grown thinner, something of gloom and anxiety had taken the place of that cordial serenity which used to characterize his features. His dark blue eyes, always penetrating, now gleamed with a sterner light from under his shaggy grey eyebrows. It was not such a change as grief alone usually induces, and angrier passions seem to have had their share in bringing it about. We had not long resumed our drive when the general began to talk, with his usual soldiery directness, of the bereavement, as he termed it, which he had sustained in the death of his beloved niece and ward, and he then broke out in a tone of intense bitterness and fury, inveighing against the hellish arts to which she had fallen a victim, and expressing with more exasperation than piety his wonder that heaven should tolerate so monstrous an indulgence of the lusts and malignity of hell. My father, who saw at once that something very extraordinary had befallen, asked him, if not too painful to him, to detail the circumstances which he thought justified the strong terms in which he had expressed himself. I should tell you all with pleasure, said the general, but you would not believe me. Why should I not? he asked. Because, he answered testily, you believing nothing but what consists with your own prejudices and illusions. I remember when I was like you, but I have learned better. Try me, said my father. I am not such a dogmatist as you suppose. Besides which, I very well know that you generally require proof for what you believe, and I am therefore very strongly predisposed to respect your conclusions. You are right in supposing that I have not been led lightly into a belief in the marvellous for what I have experienced is marvellous. And I have been forced by extraordinary evidence to credit that which ran counter diametrically to all my theories. I have been made the dupe of a preternatural conspiracy. Notwithstanding his professions of confidence in the general's penetration, I saw my father at this point glance at the general with, as I thought, a marked suspicion of his sanity. The general did not see it, luckily. He was looking gloomily and curiously into the glades and visors of the woods that were opening before us. You are going to the ruins of Karnstein, he said. Yes, it is a lucky coincidence. Do you know I was going to ask you to bring me there to inspect them? I have a special object in exploring. There is a ruined chapel, ain't there, with a great many tombs of that extinct family. So there are. Highly interesting, said my father. I hope you are thinking of claiming the title and estates. My father said this gaily, but the general did not recollect the laugh or even smile, which courtesy exacts a friend's joke. On the contrary, he looked grave and even fierce, ruminating on a manner that stirred his anger and horror. Something very different, he said gruffly. I mean to unearth some of those fine people, I hope, by God's blessing, to accomplish a pious sacrilege here, which will relieve our earth of certain monsters and enable honest people to sleep in their beds without being assailed by murderers. I have strange things to tell you, my dear friend, such as I myself would have scouted as incredible a few months ago. My father looked at him again, but this time not with a glance of suspicion, with an eye rather of keen intelligence and alarm. The house of Karnstein, he said, has long been extinct. A hundred years at least, my dear wife was maternally descended from the Karnsteins, but the name and title have long ceased to exist. The castle is a ruin. The very village is deserted. 
It is fifty years since the smoke of a chimney was last seen there. Not a roof left. Quite true. I have heard a great deal about that since I last saw you, a great deal that will astonish you, but I had better relate everything in the order in which it occurred, said the general. You saw my dear ward, my child, I may call her. No creature could have been more beautiful, and only three months ago, none more blooming. Yes, poor thing, when I saw her last, she certainly was quite lovely, my father said. I was grieved and shocked more than I can tell you. My dear friend, I knew what a blow it was to you. He took the general's hand, and they exchanged a kind of pressure. Tears gathered in the old soldier's eyes. He did not seek to conceal them. He said, We have been very old friends. I knew you would feel for me, childless as I am. She had become an object of very near interest to me. And repaid my care by an affection that cheered my home and made my life happy. That is all gone. The years that remain to me on earth may not be very long, but by God's mercy I hope to accomplish a service to mankind before I die, and to subserve the vengeance of heaven upon the fiends who have murdered my poor child in the spring of her hopes and beauty. You said just now that you intended relating everything as it occurred, said my father. Pray do. I assure you that it is not mere curiosity that prompts me. By this time we had reached the point at which the Dranstall road, by which the general had come, diverges from the road which we were travelling to Karnstein. How far is it to the ruins? inquired the general, looking anxiously forward. About half a league, answered my father. Pray, let us hear the story you were so good as to promise.